The Macabre World Podcast is brought to you by Darker Art Studio, home of real human bone jewelry. Stock and custom pieces are available, so visit us on the web at www.darkerartstudio.com and show them your darker art side. Macabre World, a podcast from Darker Art Studio, where we explore the dark, strange, and unusual from this world and beyond. Hello and welcome to the Macabre World Podcast. I'm your host, Rocky Bugatti, and with us today, the most reverend Bishop James Long from the United States Old Catholic Church. Bishop Long, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. So the United States Old Catholic Church, Mm -hmm. some of us have have grown up with what I'd like to call the regular old Roman Catholic Church that we associate uh, with the Pope, etc. Tell me a little bit about about this, this sect of Catholicism. Well, you know, a lot of people don't know about it, and there's a reason. There's, there's several reasons for it. Um, I studied for the Roman Catholic priesthood for six years. I studied with the Benedictines and the Jesuits. Truly one of the best years. True, honestly, was the best years of my life. Uh, I love the Benedictines deeply. I love the Jesuits. Uh, I went to Loyola University in Chicago, and boy, that was a, that was a complete different world than the Louisville, Kentucky. For I mean, that's you know, <laughs> Chicago, but it was... Um, but when I was studying, I, I, as I continued to, to study more about the history of the church and other issues, I, I also had issues, real serious issues about the, the idea that women can't be ordained. Uh, to me, that, that was a problem for me. I, I could not, I couldn't square that in my mind, theologically, philosophically, I just could not come to terms with understanding, well, why not? And but there was never a, a, there was never any, an answer, a valid a, an answer that I thought made sense theologically, or or any other uh, on any other level. So it, that was a problem. And then you know, married clergy, to to me, I I feel that the clergy certainly should be married, and and, and that should be an option. But there were just and and the the fact that the Pope, uh, you know, the, uh, the infallibility of the Pope. And I, as I read. Of the old Catholics. So basically, Pope Leo XIII gave uh, the church in Utrecht in the Netherlands complete autonomy. And the reason is because he couldn't come, go back and forth, you know, to, to or, consecrate and ordain. So he gave them autonomy and they were able to do that. And they became a very wealthy church. Uh, now they got no help financially from the church, the Roman church, but then the church was having some issues financially. And so the church said, okay, well, your church is doing great. Now, now we want your property. Now we want your money. And the church in Utrecht said, no, 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 we have complete autonomy. And the money that we have is the community. It, the community is, is the one who built the church. We're not going to just give everything to you. We need the money here. No, no, that's not how it works. And if you don't do it, you're heretics. So there was a huge uh, historically fight. that comes up now and then. Uh, and for, it's true. It is true. And then of course they said no. And then well, the church then the, the pope declared himself infallible on certain on certain uh, doctrine. And the church then in, in Utrecht said that's it. You know that the, you're you're you're, you're we're, we're done. So. What's different, now we have apostolic succession, and the Roman church does say in Dominus Jesus that was written by, that was signed by Pope John Paul and uh, Benedict, that any church that has apostolic succession is considered validly Catholic. So they do recognize our orders. Sure. And so we can show our lineage to Peter. I have a 121 page document showing my, my apostolic uh, lineage to Peter. Um, but it's different very much so in that within the old Catholic church, you have some that are very liberal. You have some that are uh, ultra conservative and some that are moderate. You have some jurisdictions that will ordain women. Some will not. Um, so it, some will ordain uh, LGBTQ uh, IA folks and some people will not. And so it really just depends on the jurisdiction and the Bishop. And so I, I left the Roman Catholic church and um, was ordained to the diaconate, to the presbyterate and consecrated to the episcopacy of the, and, and the, the difficulty is we don't, when we're ordained, we're ordained, we're not given a church building. We're not saying, okay, here's a building, here's parishioners, not right. going here's your, here's your, here's your church, here's your steeple. We're, we're, yeah. We are literally saying, okay, we are, we have the ordinations, we have the consecration, and then you build your community from scratch. And there is no paycheck. There is no retirement. Right. There is, there, there's literally, there's nothing that you receive as far as financial compensation at all, and you fund your own ministry. 
And that's why a lot of people don't know about the old Catholic church, because we don't have a lot of parishes because it, takes, it seems like it takes an awful lot to get the feet on the ground. It, it is. It going, really is. Term. Yeah. Because you know, you can't go, you, we, we don't, can't go about in 500. We can't go buy a $500,000 church building um, unless we win the lottery. So it's it just difficult. Now you can work with other church, uh, other denominations. And we do that. We've worked with Calvary Lutheran church in Louisville when we had a parish in Louisville, but they closed due to financial uh, restraints. So we're still, we're looking, I would love to start another parish in Kentucky would love to. Uh, and I'm, I, that's, that's a goal that absolutely, and it will happen. Well, I, I, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. Your conviction is very clear. And it sounds like if, if folks are looking for something with the tenets and basic uh, uh, concepts of the Catholic Church, but maybe something a little bit more progressive, they should give a give a, 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 a they should check out the old Roman Catholic, or at least to be the old Catholic Church. Yeah, I, and again, uh, keep in mind that with each church is different. Uh, so, right, but uh, it's the, it's an alternate. I think a lot of people didn't know existed. Yeah, yeah. So, how do you get from going? Well, I know the call's the call, and that's that. <laughs> you get to call. How did you end up helping the haunted? Well, you know, I had studied since I was nine. I began studying books on on, on demonology, and I didn't. I knew I wanted to be a priest when I was five. There's no question about, I mean, I, that's what I wanted to do. And you used to play church when you were a kid. I did. And I was always the <laughs> priest and my sister had the audacity to think that she was going to, be, Oh no, no, no. Oh, dear. Uh, it's interesting how now I support women ordination, but she was not going to be the priest, but <laughs> you never I look began, at a candidate mint the same way again, do you? Yeah. I can't have what no wafer. <laughs> oh, you know, I, you know, the thing is, is I love wafers. I, 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 I do. I, I could, I, I, my problem, I eat way. I love wafers. I, it's just flour and water. Um, but I do. I, I could I could snack on them, of course, not consecrated. So let me just make that clear for anybody calls me her heretical and all this. <laughs> we don't um, want letters on this because <laughs> uh, I'm sure it'll come. But no, I, I began reading at nine on demonology and angelology, and I didn't know a lot of what I was reading. I just knew that I couldn't put it down. I was just it, it, became, an obs- it, 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 it became an obsession. Anything paranormal. But I've always said demonology is not paranormal. Demonology is theological. So, but, but I love anything paranormal. And I also love the theological aspects of demonology. I just could not stop reading. It became an obsession. And when I went to the seminary, they had a, a plethora of information. I mean, it was, a, it was phenomenal. And I really dug deep into that. And, but you know, I was trained, uh, we, we were trained obviously in the rights and I, I, I didn't want to go public with my ministry. I wanted to stay quiet because what people don't know about me is I, I am actually, if your uh, personality traits or pipes, if you, if you follow that, I'm an INFJ. Gotcha. So, but when I'm Bishop Long, ex- extrovert with an extreme, I mean, level, but I didn't want to go public. I wanted to stay private. And, but I had friends in the paranormal said, James, there's no paranormal. There's no clergy helping. There's no Catholic. We have no Catholic clergy helping anybody. Uh, there was there was Father Andrew Calder, who was a schismatic group from the Episcopalians, but he was not called to serve as an exorcist. He he would perform blessings on homes, but as far as the solemn rite, he was not called to do that. Well, and isn't I became the solemn rite of exorcism more or less as as we know it, as most people picture it. And I think ninety percent of the people, Catholic or not, when you say exorcism, they mm-hmm. have the exorcist. They're, sure. they're picturing yeah. Father Karras. And, and all that. But that yeah. particular right is, 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 is unique to the Catholic Church. Well, it is unique to the Catholic Church in that because it, it, the, the Catholic Church has the foundations in which it was created the office of exorcist. So this is a very ancient right in, that we see the first published right in 1614. So this is an ancient uh, ritual that was created by the church for the need of expelling demonic entities uh, in cases of possession. Now, there's also what's called the minor rite of exorcism. Now, the minor rite of exorcism is when you perform an exorcism on a demonic entity that has infested itself within a building or home, and you force the entity to manifest, and then you expel that demonic. That's different than the solemn rite. The solemn rite is a ritual that is strictly reserved for an individual who's gone through the process of infestation, oppression, possession, and demonic obsession. And then, uh, obviously, they're in the stage of possession. You perform the solemn rite. So, I continued my training and my studies in the rites. I received my minor orders in the Roman Catholic Church, and, and that is when I decided to, to, to you know, progress to the old. That were the road forks. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, like I said, I didn't want to go public, and then I because there was no Catholic clergy helping. Uh, it was right. again Andy, and I became very good friends with Andy, and 
uh, and then it just exploded. I mean, it just like all of a sudden, just like a magic. I mean, it just carpet ride. It just took off like a rocket. And I was not, I was not, in, I was very, um, not the word uh, gullible. I, I, I lived somewhat of a sheltered life in the very structured Roman Catholic uh, family upbringing. And my, my perception of, of, I guess, life in general was um, everything was, everybody was going to be kind and generous and um, that kind of thing. But when I found death threats coming at me, because I was defending people who were Wiccan or pagan or LGBT, or I was, I was kind of, I, so I didn't people know how got to, upset at you for not being a jerk. I was getting, I was getting death threats. It I'm was sorry getting, to hear that. that's, it that's was getting, inexcusable. 15 years ago when I did, um, I did uh, a, um, a paranormal conference in Indiana, the death threats were getting so serious. The police had to get involved. The death oh, no. threats were getting so s serious that when I went to parish and when I was having mass, I had a gun under my vestments because I was afraid someone was going to come in and shoot the parishioners. And not only that, but I was, in, I was invited to a, a conference in Indianapolis and they had to hire four, I think four or five police, I forgot how many, four or five police officers to stand literally right behind me because of these death threats, only because I defended people's right to be Wiccan, pagan, and LGBT. It was unbelievable. I, I just, I didn't know how to respond. Well, I think there's a whole lot of people who are going to be listening that stand behind you on that because I, I think the spirit of, of a lot of, and I don't mean to say that as a pun, but the spirit of paranormal uh, investigators tends to be very ecumenical, I think. I think it tends to incorporate a lot of different faiths. And I think there's a whole, because we're all sort of searching along the same lines for the same kinds of answers. And, and I think everybody's got a little bit of the right idea. Yeah, I, I think degree. so. I think so. So, so did you, uh, now you said you were fascinated as a kid by, by yep. the, the angels and demons and that type of thing. Did you have any experiences before your professional uh, exposure to, to any kind of exorcism or do you have any personal experiences like growing up and when, when you, before you, I do, I do, I do. You know, the first, the first pl place that I ever investigated was Waverly Hills. The sanatorium, uh, Louisville, oh, Kentucky. Yes. My goodness gravy and Waverly Hills. Let me tell you, Waverly Hills. When I went there, I, I was there, uh, you know, I, it was closed, but the owner at that time didn't care. I mean, he, right. it was known to go up there and people actually went up there and vandalized it because he wanted really it to be condemned so they could break it, that tear it down and he can build a huge uh, Jesus statue there. So he really wanted it condemned. Um, but we went up there and oh yeah, that was, um, we went into the, the, to the, like the basement area where the great, it's a huge, huge open area. And there was an old rusty wheelchair that was on its side. And, but we kept hearing like a whimpering, uh, like a little, uh, sound like a little girl crying. And we thought, what in the world? And we kind of thought that maybe a little child snuck up there and got lost or something and couldn't find their way back. So we thought, well, you know, we're, we got to go towards this. So we went up the stairs and we heard it got louder and louder. And I think we were on the second floor, third floor. I can't remember which floor it was. But as we go, were going down the halls, it just, it was louder and louder. So then we went to like, there was a bathroom area and I opened the door and there were stalls. And I opened the, the first stall and there was nothing. And I opened the second stall and I clearly there was somebody in there. And I tried to open the third stall and then bam, I mean, it sounded like someone had taken a sledgehammer and hit the stall as hard as it could the entire, I mean, they, it shook violently. We took off. We I ran. I don't think I hit, I, I think I, I literally jumped over every single one of those stairs coming down the stairs. Oh I don't think I hit one, but it, what was interesting when we went down to the auditorium section, that old rusty wheelchair, the wheel was spinning. And, but I also had um, That's a creepy a image anyway. It when was, you, you know, like old hospital is scary, yeah. old dirty, scary, especially Waverly hospital is scary stuff anyway. But I, I had a, I had a recurring a, a dream as well. Um, that was very, very effective that, that it, it took, um, it was difficult, uh, because I, I was dreaming while I was obviously sleeping. And then in my, in my sleep, I woke up and I looked over to the, to the, where the, drawer was what uh, the closed drawers are and it was a cot and it looked like it was a man lying down and he had a white gown on and I got up out of my bed and uh, this is still in dreaming sure. and I walked over and I noticed it was Christ 
he had gold sandals, he had a white alb on, he had the crown of thorns, his, uh, his skin was like a sharp grayish color, uh, his, his hands were on his chest, and his nails were a little lengthy, a little long, but he was bleeding, I could, the crown of thorns, I could, you know, he had that on. So I reached down to his hand, and I held his hand, and he opened his eyes, bloodshot red, it was a dull, dull red, he, uh, stood, he rose up, and his exact words were, what the H are you looking at? And that obviously frightened me. So I grabbed my first communion crucifix from the wall, and I held it up to him, and he just gave me this smirk. And with his left hand, he took the crucifix, and he crushed it. Now, his hand started to bleed, but that crucifix began to turn into ash, and it fell on the ground. And he said, is that supposed to hurt me? I died on the stupid A thing. And so I ran upstairs, I told my mom, and we called the, the, the parish priest, he came down, he was doing prayers, which ultimately was the, the exorcism. And the only thing that I remember is this thing then reached out to me, it was screaming, it was so much, it was in pain, it was like it was, the smoke was filling the area because he was using incense. And he reached out, out of the smoke, and I felt pity for this thing, because it was screaming in pain. And I reached out to his hand, and that's when I woke up. And when I woke up, oh, that's intense. I, I couldn't breathe. I could not breathe at all. And finally, I got my bearing and I was able to, but I looked over to my right. And now this was not sleep paralysis because I was not in a par paralytic stick. I was completely aware of my cut. I looked over to the right and I saw that Jesus figure that it's right there. He looked right at me. I looked at him. He was bleeding and he disappeared. I found the crucifix on the floor. And the foot of the, of the crucifix had been ripped apart. And on the floor where he had stayed, where, where he was, there were red stains. Now, I, my mom found out about it. And she was mad because it was a, I, 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 my whole room was basically the basement, but it was, we had marble on the floor and it was obviously expensive to fix it. But she, she used everything. She even had a, a cleaning crew to come over here, uh, come over there and actually try to clean. They couldn't get the stain off that floor. There's nothing they could do. I mean, it was, it was a lot of blood. So my mom was thinking, well, she talked to them, but what do we do? Do we just rip this thing? She said, man, by the time you rip all this up, you'd be, it's cheaper if you just put nice carpet on it. So that's what she did. She put carpet, and even to this day in that house, that house was very, very active. Even to the day, it's still active. So you, you yourself, had, what was in your dream that you, you were the subject of the exorcism. Yeah, yeah, it, it was, that it had was intense. incredibly intense. Now, the sure. first time you actually, the, I always, uh, I, we spoke briefly before, and I had said I'm a musician, and we always call it go time. When your yeah. mic turns on and the, and the band comes up and you're about to sing that first note, that's go time. Go time. When it was go time for your first exorcism, where mm. you're the lead singer, um, and, and you're taking the lead, was that terrifying for you? I mean, that must have been both exhilarating and terrifying at the same time. Well, you mean when, when I it was my when I was the lead exorcist or when I was my first exorcism as the assistant? Well, it, it, whichever, you know, when you when you were the first um, clergy to I, participate in the. First yeah, I, 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 I tell you, uh, when I was the my very first exorcism that I've ever seen in my entire life, and I've talked about this before, so um, that was that was quite terrifying because, you know, you read everything and you prepare your mind and you think you're, you're ready to go, but, and, and you hear all the stories and you read all the stories, but when you're in the presence of a demonic, you can't, there are no books. The books are not, books will get you prepared, I think on an intellectual level, but when you actually see it. So I, I, I was there, um, her eyes went, it was a girl, her eyes, which she went back on her bed and I reached down to check her eyelids to see where we are in the, tran in the transient possession. I lifted eyelids and it was solid black. There was nothing but blackness. And I could, and it was such a blackness that I could actually, I could see my reflection. And I couldn't move. I couldn't think. I couldn't talk. I was completely paralyzed. It was like I was in a, in a catatonic state. I, well, that's, that's quite know, I, terrifying. What you're it, was, it was, I mean, it was horrible, horrible because. I, I felt like I was looking in the eyes of an apex predator and I was the prey and um, had, had I not had my mentor who was there, who was the lead, who had took me, he did a blessing. I don't know what would have happened. I, I really don't. That was, um, 
And, and that was also the first time when uh, she mimicked the voice of my aunt, my, my aunt who had passed away when I was in the seminary. Oh, that's very, that's, that's, that yeah. had to have been extremely unsettling. It was unsettling, but, and it also made me mad. Um, I was like, how dare you, you know, how, how, sure. you know, how dare it's a you low do blow. That? It personal. is a low blow, but I, but it was, it was obviously trying to utilize into uh, my emotional, I think um, not weaknesses, but vulnerability Absolutely. during that time to break well, it down. Isn't that in, 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 and I, I, I remember telling you that I, I had a Catholic education as well is, is that I think from what I recall that I was always taught is that that is where in, in the doctrine, they say that that's where the negative comes in is when you, when you have that vulnerability, when you are at your lowest, that's when undesirable forces can overtake you. Is, and again, is I kind of, uh, kind of the message I, I had gotten. And, um, and, and so that, you know, after now, I assume that the, the, the incident you're speaking of that, that went with your mentor that, you know, eventually resolved. It did. And she was yeah. oh, wonderful. Good. Um, but you know, after that, what made you want to do it again? <laughs> Cause you've done how yeah. many exorcisms now? I, I've 30 plus. Loved- I've done 30 exorcisms on people who are actually validly possessed when, and it's very important because when I tell people validly possessed, because anybody can claim to be possessed, but unless you actually have verified, you know, verifiable proof that there's something going on that is not related to mental illness. So they, you know, they have to have a psychological evaluation. That's non-negotiable. We have a team. I have at least someone there who is medically trained monitoring the vitals of the possessed. So I need to see several things that this individual is exhibiting that clearly indicates that this is not mental illness. So, for example, um, retrocognition. Well, really, when you're you're supposed to go to confession, so retrocognition should not be an issue. Retrocognition is when the demonic is able to tell you your sins, and it's not because they're able to read your mind. It's because they are the ones under demonic influence, uh, what we call ordinary demonic activity, that's caused you to sin in the first place. So they certainly would know the sins you've committed. So through retrocognition, that is not, that has nothing to do with mental illness uh, or prognostication, uh, where they have the ability to tell you that someone, you know, if you're married or you have a wife or husband or whatever it might be, and that your husband or wife cheated on you or something of this nature. Um, and, And of course, levitation. Uh, or, or knowing, you know, this dead languages that they've never been, you know, trained in, and so, but even superhuman strength. Well, you know, you, someone who's on PCP could have superhuman Very strength. So, or, yeah. I'm a so there are uh, uh, EMT, so I've seen it. It is, yeah. it's, it's very, it's marked. <laughs> yeah. So we have to make sure that this individual truly is suffering with uh, possession rather than psychosis. It's, it's a difficult, I mean, it has to be a difficult call to make, and it has to be angsty in the sense that while you're trying to determine, yeah, you know, do you get a sixth sense about it? Like, do you, when someone comes to you, can you tell either A, if they're, if they're mentally affected in a, a more clinical sense, or if they are spiritually affected in the more demonic sense? Is that an yep. easy call to make usually? Or I know you have your, 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 your thing, but do you actually get a snap judgment? Have you gotten to that point where you have an instinct that says, yeah, I think I know which way to go with this? I, I, hear, I hear what you're saying, but I, 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 I cut that out. I, 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 don't, I don't allow that to enter into my, into my mind because I don't, want to, um, I don't want to accidentally lead my mind into thinking A or B. I, I want to make sure that I have all the evidence and it's presented to me logically. I see everything. It's clear that we're dealing with something because I don't want that to taint my, uh, my decision because someone could legitimately have uh, a demonic you know, activity going on. And I could say, well, in my mind immediately, just, I don't, I just don't want to believe it. And then that could taint my, my, I think my opinion on the case. So for what I do is anybody who comes to me, I look at them with a complete open, you know, blank canvas. And I'm like, okay, so you think you're possessed. Why? What's, what's happening? And, and then they, they go on to the process. And then, of course, then we have the psychological. We need to make sure to speak to people in the medical field. I don't know the, a lot of issues that go on with uh, medication. And sometimes medication can cause someone to hallucinate. Or, sure. So I need to be trained in that as well. Hey, here, here's a list of medications. And, and this is the psych, psychological evaluation from the licensed psychiatrist. But even then, 
Now, let's say, for example, I go into someone's home and they're suffering from transient possession. All right, transient possession is when the demonic enters the body, leaves at will. They're still always under the stage of demonic oppression, demonic obsession, where the demonic is attacking the intellect and will of the person. Obviously, it's because they want the, per the, the body to be at a, a vulnerable state so the possession can still take place. Now, the problem comes in when I show up um, many times, especially if someone is uh, suffering from transient possession, they may not be in that possessed state. So I will do things that that person has no idea what I'm doing, no clue whatsoever. I am provoking, provoking through prayer and provoking by using the sacramentals of the church, the holy water, incense, oil. And I'm going to force that entity to manifest itself through the provocation of prayer. If that does not occur, then the exorcism does not take place. So I will, I can certainly pray a, a prayer of deliverance, but I will not pray, uh, pray the solemn rite of exorcism unless there is a clear indication that there is a, um, a demonic that's there. So I think that you're describing, and, and it's definitely an education for me, and I'm sure for many who are listening, there's, there's a far more scientific method to oh, this yeah. than I think most people realize. And again, I'm, I'm going to say it, Hollywood has given the closest, I mean, the if you ask somebody, you know, to picture an exorcism, they're either going to picture the exorcist, or they're going to picture something maybe perhaps from one of the Ed and Lorraine Warren mm -hmm. things, because i um, if I recall, he also performed exorcisms in some capacity. Was he a deacon? I don't really, I don't oh, know. He was, the... no, no, he was not a deacon. He was a, he was considered a demonologist, but that's the one thing that I'm very, very concerned about, especially in the paranormal. That's a big no, no. Um, because I always understood that exorcism was, was a clergy operation only. Absolutely. Uh, because what's happening in the paranormal, I've been the paranormal for a long, long, long time now. And, and I have seen this, you know, when I started out, there wasn't, there weren't that many people calling themselves demonologists. Now there are so many people calling themselves demonologists, even worse, or even more concerning, I should say, is that these demonologists are performing rituals they have no business performing. So the solemn rite of exorcism is, is really, it's, it is reserved for a person who is validly trained in the rite and who's, who's been given permission by their local ordinary, their bishop, to perform this ritual. This is a very sacred ritual. By the way, the sacred rite uh, it's very clear in the rubrics, in the rules, and I didn't write it. So people get mad right. when I say this, but this was written in 1614. It says in the rules, unless you are validly trained and you have been given permission by your bishop, you have no business to even reading this prayer. And But what's happening is you have- That's canon law, is it not? It sure is. But, but that, the problem is, is people are, are, are violating that because the, it's online and they say, well, I'm a Christian, so therefore I can perform an exorcism. No, you can't. Because it also says in scripture that Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit upon his disciples, then told them to cast out demons. That's ordination. Because when the priest is there uh, representing the church, he stands obviously in persona Christi. It is not the, the exorcist that is merely there performing an exorcism. The church, the bishop, the, the litany of saints, uh, the whole entire, I mean, the whole faith structure is there with that priest as a representative of the church. And this right is very, very dangerous for people to play around with this because, you know, what bothers me is that people who are not trained in this right and you're performing an exorcism with someone with disassociative identity disorder, you create another personality. That or makes someone, perfect sense. Yeah. That, that, or, or, that or if they're in uh, paranoid schizophrenia, you could put them in a, uh, even a manic state and they can commit suicide. So it bothers me a lot that so many people are going around performing these exorcisms on people without having a psychological evaluation, without knowing the medical background, without knowing the medicines that they're taking. Well, they're feeding into their psychosis, and that's just wrong. That's that's I, I'm so glad you got a chance to elaborate on that point, because that's a really responsible way to look at it. And I think that I know that you've been involved with some of the some of the more uh, popular TV shows. And I know that a lot of people, I think, are, are getting kind of a, a glimpse into like I've been part I, I've been in, uh, investigating the paranormal for uh, almost 30 years now. And, you know, there's there's been other there are a lot of other groups and there's now lots of media on this type of thing. And I think you're right. I think the access to information gives you the information without the education. Yeah, that's good. It's a good point. It does. And it gives you the information without the education. That's a great point. And I, and well, it, 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 coupled with what you had just said, I mean, you know, you're saying you, you could accidentally feed into somebody's psychosis and set off a yeah. chain reaction that could lead to tragedy. 
And and that's not an yeah. otherworldly tragedy. That's a right here, right now, clinical kind of tragedy. That's right. You know, that's not, and, and, it's, it's, yep. it's not up for debate there. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand. I mean, it, it, it's so, I, I, you know, the television shows, people ask me, why did you do so many television shows? Well, first of all, I, haven't, I didn't get paid for them. That's number one. And, and second, that, well, they, they are fun. But see, the thing is, is, I wanted to, I looked at it. Okay, I started the paranormal clergy, uh, which was about 20 years ago. The whole point of the paranormal clergy was to build a network of paranormal teams around the United States so that when I have someone telling me, hey, I'm in New York or California or Texas, can you help me? I can reach out to a team. Hey, can you help us with this? That was the whole point of the paranormal clergy, but I, I couldn't afford to go out and put uh, advertisements on television or radio because we do it for free. Right. So the, the television shows gave me the opportunity to let people to promote the paranormal clergy. And uh, for, you know, that was a great advertisement that and to, to help people for free. That's, that's all it was. And uh, it, it grew to a pretty, pretty large. And then I gave it to Rich Valdez. So I'm no longer the owner of the paranormal clergy. The point was to build it up and give it to laity and have them own it and run it. Well, it seems that, you know, you, you, you have a lot going on. I, I appreciate yeah. that you had taken the time to talk with us uh, tonight, because I know that you have, um, you, you said you're, you're a chaplain at a hospital, you have a mm -hmm. lot of, you know, you have your own ministry going. And, and it's, and it's good. Now, if folks want to learn more about uh, what you do with the United States Old Catholic Church, where can they go? Well, uh, actually, I teach, I teach uh, four classes online. They're all, it's all on the one course, the same course. I teach demonology, angelology, paranormal studies, and genealogy. 100% of that goes to funding the ministry. I, I, I have helped single moms now for about 15 years. So I help young single moms who leave an abusive relationship or trying to establish themselves, and they need help. You know, sometimes they need pay, you know, help to pay their electric or maybe a first month's rent or deposit. People say to me all the time, well, why don't they just go to government assistance to get help? Well, if you've oh, ever gone to government assistance, to get, that's a lot of red tape, and it might take you two or three months to get that help. And they need help where now. are they living? How are, that's they, right. how are they surviving? Sure. That's right. And so I've been doing that. Plus, I've been doing homeless ministry for about 30 years now. So I'm very active in the homeless ministry. I go to homeless camps in Indiana, Kentucky, and Tennessee. And I pass out food and clothes, sleeping bags. Um, and then, of course, the ministry of going to people's homes and bless their homes. And so that it's, it's been tough. It, it's very, very difficult uh, to do so this. So folks want to help, yep. there's a link on your, on your website, isn't there? Yeah, where... you can go to bishopjameslong.com, scroll down. They can make a donation. Also, if they go to bishopjameslong.com, they can click on the class link. And there's the, the link for them to sign up for the course as well. And those will be uh, those links will also be in the description of the podcast so that you can click them and, and see if what see what you can do to help out your fellow man. I think that what you're doing is some great work. I, I thank you so much for sharing your experiences. I'd love to have you on again because I got to hear more about the exorcisms because I'm sure that there's some movies that got it right and some movies that got it wrong. And I'm yeah. curious, that's actually, that's going to be my parting question. If you were going to pick mm -hmm. a film that yep. was somewhat close to the Easy. reality of the experience, is there one? Absolutely, 100%, no question about it. The movie, The Right. I, I had the opportunity to speak to Father Gary Thomas, who the movie that is, is based after and i gotta tell you the with anthony hopkins it is the most one of the most amazing movies that gives you an insight of what Chilling. an exorcist I saw it. yeah phenomenal it, it from because is it from an exorcist perspective and you see what what we go through uh, as clergy and as exorcists and, and I, there's no question the the right is phenomenal Bishop, thank you for all of the good work that you do. Thank you so much for helping the haunted and taking the time to explain a little bit about that to us today. I hope that you get a chance to um, have more people come on and have, so definitely check out his website so that folks can, can help contribute and help learn and we can all grow together. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate this. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Macabre World. You can find us on the web at www.darkerartstudio.com. <laughs>